Good afternoon, everyone. I am so lucky today. I have two ladies to introduce to you in different roles. <laughs> You've known them as librarians, as project managers, and now they have moved up in their careers, <laughs> so to speak. And I first, I would like to introduce you to, to Hannah Nedrick Mason. Mason. And she is our new office project manager. And I welcome. think you should <laughs> welcome, you. welcome you. A lot of you know her from the Saugatuck Douglas Library. Very important uh, building in that part of our uh, state and our county. And so she is going to be um, taking Amy's mm -hmm. full position. And the other in individual I need to introduce you today is our very own Amy Weber, who was once our project manager and is now, I call, Madam Director <laughs> of, of HASP. So would you welcome both of these ladies today? <laughs> Anna, Amy is going to speak in just a moment. <laughs> but all of you, we are so Happy to have you here, and I'm Kit Leggett, and I'm on the social sciences team. And I'm going to ask you once again, if you would check your phones, make sure they are silenced so that they won't distract from the presentation today. And I thank you very much for that in advance. We're also welcoming to our crowd today, our course technician, Mary Ellen, is it Mayuyo? Mayulo. And she is supporting our hybrid modality, and we could thank her as well, because what she does is a very important thing today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If you have any questions or comments to pose at appropriate times, mm -hmm. we kindly ask that you wait for the microphone to come around and so that all the participants here in the room can hear you. Online participants may share in the Zoom chat and the technicians will let us know when their questions are available. So here we are. We're gonna learn how to herd cats and balance the budget. And it's it's about time. <laughs> oh, yeah. Balance the budget, yes. yes, yes. As citizens, taxpayers, and voters, what should we know about the federal government and government shutdowns. In this course, we're going to consider certain aspects of the federal government, its agencies and workforce, as well as how the budget is created. So today, our first session is going to concentrate on the departments and agencies that comprise the federal government and the history of their staffing. And our speaker slash director worked for 19 years as both a federal government contractor and employee. The latter positions included terms at all of these departments, defense, housing and urban development, state, justice, and commerce. And Amy holds an MA in criminology and criminal justice from the University of Memphis. And I am so excited to hear her. And would you welcome once again our brand new director, Madam Amy Weber. <laughs> Thank you, Kat. Whoops, taking some of my presentation with you. Yep, that's good. <laughs> We'd be lost. <laughs> no, we wouldn't. Thank you guys so much. First off, I want to acknowledge the fact that I realize there's a solar eclipse happening. <laughs> so it'll start at around two. I promise to have you out around 2.15. You have plenty of time to go to wherever you're going to see the totality. If you don't have a place to go, you can stick around here at HASP. We'll brew some more coffee. And Hannah has brought some glasses um, so we can actually do some viewing. So if you don't have a place to go to see it, you guys can stick around HASP. Um, before we get started, I wanted to talk to you about why I wanted to do this class. So when I first moved to Michigan, and this was five years ago, when my husband and I moved, my husband's also a federal employee, um, we moved here and there was a shutdown under the previous administration. Um, there was a shutdown and I was kind of, I was meeting new people, I was meeting new friends, and I realized there was a lot they didn't, 
they weren't asking kind of the same questions that me as a federal worker would ask. They didn't seem to concentrate on the th same things when we were talking about shutdowns. And also I was a little stymied by the local media. They seemed to have different numbers in their coverage than what I was reading in the Washington Post, which I still had a subscription to um, at the time. And I was like, why are these numbers up? Where are they getting 4.5 million instead of 2.1 million? Where are they getting 500,000 instead of 1.3? Um, so it took me a while to realize they were kind of talking about different things, apples and oranges, apples and oranges. And so um, I was talking to House members when I first started working here, just talking about life. And this topic came up about government shutdown. There was a looming shutdown at the time. And I said, you know what, I, I think maybe there's some information here that I could impart. Um, and again, I'm just hopeful that this information for you as a taxpayer, as a voter, but just as a consumer of federal services, we are all consumers of federal services, um, that there's something there that you might find interesting and make you a better, more intelligent reader for all those articles that are written uh, every time we go through a government shutdown. <laughs> so that's kind of the purpose of this class. Let me start here though. How many of you have been in the United States military, served in the military? Excellent, okay, thank you for your service. How many of you have been feds? Federal civilian employees. Okay, then. <laughs> okay, great. So I can make stuff up. That's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm hearing. Has anybody been a federal contractor? No? How about a federal grant recipient? So, yeah, okay. Yeah, you have federal grants. Well, academics often apply to federal grants, right? In whether it's medical research um, or in any sort of research, quite honestly, um, with that. And lastly, has anybody worked for the post office? Okay, Marilyn, yes, <laughs> good. So we have two postal workers on other HAS members um, with that. Okay, great. Um, those are some of the agencies we'll be talking about. Okay, so now this, this one, I'm gonna make you participate. And those of you online, you can just shout it out at your houses. Um, when I say federal workforce, what the federal government does, what, what pops into your mind? Just pops into your head. What was that? Be nice, corruption. Well, okay, we don't do corruption, but yeah, what was that? A taxes, IRS, anything else? Hmm? Nonpartisan, okay. What about the actual work the federal government's doing? The actual work, what do, what do federal workers do? A veterinarian, yes, yeah. We actually have federal workers that work with dogs, work with horses and train dolphins, yep. Mm -hmm. Parks, yes, the National Park Service. We've got park rangers out there. That's right. Regulations, there's lots of regulations they do. Some, the CIA. That's right, Danny can't tell us about his service, but yes, the CIA is out there as well. Social Security, Medicare, those are some big ones that are out there too. The fact of the matter is the federal government is a large dynamic Place. And it has a much larger scope than most people, even those who work in the federal government, are aware. Just to give you some numbers, and I tried to remember these and I couldn't, so I wrote them down. <laughs> How many law enforcement agencies do you think we have? Federal law enforcement agencies, just off the top of your head. 50? 92. Oh, so close, you guys. 73. <laughs> 73 federal law enforcement agencies. We have 122 federal prisons. We often forget that these federal crimes get you into federal prison, which means we have federal prison guards, right? We have 271 embassies and consulates in 173 countries. So remember, we have federal workers at each one of those embassies and consulates, right? We have 4,790 military sites worldwide. That's 27 million acres of land um, that we're responsible for. So we have buildings on that, we have staff on that, we have to up, you know, the electricity, the water, everything into these, these facilities. 61 national parks and 400 preserves, recreational areas, and national monuments. We have 326 Indian land areas. They're not all called reservations. So Indian land areas. We, your tax dollars, your tax dollars, <laughs> go for astronauts, but they also go for butlers. They go for dolphin trainers and art historians, chefs and band conductors, and even volcanologists. So if you can dream up a profession 
there's probably a federal worker working on it. And if not a federal worker, a federal contractor um, that's doing it. So the federal government is huge. All right, we're gonna have a, just a review of some basic civics, your basic civics lessons from school, okay? Hang with me, it'll get more fun later. There'll be graphs later. We have lots of graphs. <laughs> Okay, when we're in school, we're taught this, that the United States, we have a constitution and it's broken into three parts, right? Article one is about Congress. Article two is about the executive branch. Article three is about the court system. And this is it, right? Okay. This is what we're taught when we're in elementary school. Then we grow up and we realize it's a little bit more complicated. Now, if we base only our federal knowledge on what we see in movies and television, we might think that it looks like this. The legislature has the Senate in the the House, the Judiciary has the Supreme Court, the Appeal, some of the district courts, but really it's all about the cabinet, right? The West Wing that, that happens, right? All the departments that are out there. The departments have been around since the beginning of the country. So the departments and the cabinet, I'm gonna use those two words the same right now. You'll find out later the cabinet separate than the departments themselves. But the cabinet um, has been around since George Washington. So the original, um, the original founding fathers, mothers of this country, um, they said, okay, the president does need an advisory council, but they were very suspicious about having one. They couldn't figure out how to put it in the constitution because jo King George had an advisory council and they, they thought that wasn't some good advice, right? That whole stamp tax was a problem. <laughs> so they said, uh, we want the advisors to be more public. And so they never figured out what to do with this. So George Washington kind of had to make it up on the fly. And so he decided, okay, I'm gonna take in the people that I'm closest to that I need information on of the things I need to establish a Republic. And he established the first departments of the federal government. Anybody wanna guess what the first, I'll give you a hint, there's three what the first three departments was from the federal government. Oh, oh, okay, I heard defense first. <laughs> yeah, it was called the Department of War um, and it originally was just the army, right? It was the part that George Washington had commanded. Eventually we add in things like the Department of the Navy, the Department of, um, the uh, Department of Army gets separated from the Department of War, et cetera. It eventually becomes after World War II what we now call the Department of Defense. So the Department of War is a precursor to that. So yes, the Department of Defense. What was the next one? Treasury, that's right. Alexander Hamilton will not stop singing the, in the seats of New York about how much we need federal money. And so we just said, fine, Alexander, you can have Treasury. And we develop, the Department of Treasury is established too. What's the third one? Yes, we needed friends, right? We needed treaties, we needed friends. And Jefferson needed something to do. So we gave him the State Department. <laughs> um, the, the war, by the way, was Henry Knox, the first um, secretary of the Department of War at the time it was Henry Knox, as in Knox, Tennessee, or Knox, Fort Knox. Okay, same, same individual. So then um, the other person that, that Washington decided to put on his cabinet was the attorney general. Okay, and this was not a department. We did not have a Department of Justice. We just had an attorney general, and this was Edmund Randolph. So the the attorney general has a different title. Now the attorney general is the head of the Department of Justice, but doesn't isn't called secretary, right? So we have a secretary of treasury, a secretary of defense. We have an attorney general, okay, slightly different. Okay, this is in 1787 and George Washington is happy with this. <laughs> we're, we're, we're all good. There's another function though, that is super crucial, important, it turns out to colonial America, and that's the postal service. And they develop a department of the post office in 1792. And that's a department inside of the presidential cabinet up until 1971, when um, Richard Nixon did away with it with the Postal Reform Act, okay? And then we devoted it. We'll talk about where the post office ended up landing inside the federal government in a second. Now, I promise we're not going through all of these departments, but one, one more, <laughs> I just wanna tell you about. So then everybody's happy. For 60 years, nobody does anything. Nobody, we're doing lots of stuff as a nation, but we decide we don't need to really organize it very much until it gets a little out of control in the early 1800s. And in 1849, we developed the Interior Department. And the Interior Department becomes the department of everything else we forgot about, but we've been doing, okay? Some of the things the original Interior Department did, they established the border with Mexico. They monitored hospitals and universities. 
they did the census, which we had been doing all along. It's just we hadn't really known where to put it. They had all of oversight over Washington, D.C. They had to figure out the sewer systems. They had to figure out the water systems. They had to figure out the prisons. They administered pensions. They commissioned the geological and topographical surveys of the nation as we were growing westward. They also had to figure out issues. There were slave revolts in Haiti. They had to come up with a way we were going to have relationships with Haiti and the slave revolt. So the Interior Department was just all over the place. Today, we know the Interior Department is being mainly the Bureau of Indian Affairs, all those great geographical topographical surveys, <laughs> and also the National Park Service, which doesn't get formed until much later. Okay, so, so of these first agencies that are first around, we have good examples here of what happens with the federal government. It grows, it contracts, it changes from different policies. The Department of Defense grew in scope. It wasn't just about the Army. We needed to include all of the military, right? The Department of the Interior gets de-scoped. Most of those things, establishing borders, doing the census, those go off to other departments later on. It's not like we, we stopped doing the census. It's just now with the Commerce Department, okay? So that's an example of us contracting a department. The Postal Service is an, is an example of us deciding we wanted different policy. So there was a political decision made to work on the post office being more of a money-making enterprise, not being at the cabinet level, and it disappears. Okay? So we've been doing that all along in, in our history. Just one last, the Agriculture Department was the last one founded in 1862. So if you're keeping track, of the current 15 executive departments that exist, that are on the cabinet, six were founded in the first 115 years of the country. And then everything else was founded in the 20th and 21st centuries, including our most recent one, which is Homeland Security. Okay? All right, fun fact. <laughs> Here's your fun fact about cabinets. Did you know that the age of the agency determines who sits where at the cabinet table? Okay, so if you see Biden, right, he's there on the, and I apologize to the people online, my clicker I don't think can work to see you. But if you see Biden right here, he's got defense and he's got state, right? His right and left pants. Kamala Harris, the vice president's across the way. She's got treasury and poor Merrick Garland, the attorney general, his hair is right here, Merrick Garland, okay? So that's that's would have been what Washington's cabinet looked like, right? The next one done would have been interior. That's for us, Deb Hamblin, right? She's over here. Agriculture comes around in the, um, the next agency. So over here. So now what they start to do is they start to crisscross like a, um, like a shoelace. So Deb Hamblin and then agriculture, which is currently this, Vilsack, Vilsack, our, our secretary of agriculture. And then the next agency that was actually formed was what was called Commerce and Labor. It got separated into two, Commerce and Labor. So you see the Commerce Secretary right here, the Labor Secretary right there. And anyway, it goes around like that. It, um, around. So interesting fact. If you ever see them, you know how old their agency is from that. Currently, the cabinet also consists of a bunch of people that are not <laughs> the, the heads of the executive department. They include the Chief of Staff, the U.S. Trade Representative, the EPA, the OMB, which is the Office of Management and Budget, um, the Council of Economic Advisors, the Office of Science and Tech Policy. So if you were wondering why we don't have a department of that, because it's currently in office, and the Small Business Administration. So that's currently who sits on cabinets. All right, but this isn't a good representation of the federal government either, right? Doesn't help us at all. This is what the federal government looks like. <laughs> okay. You can all read it, right? It's perfectly fine. At least they color coded it. Even this is a little inaccurate. It's missing the Bureau of Prisons and I don't know why <laughs> it's on there. Okay, I wanna talk, stop for one second before we drill into this to talk a little bit about language. The word department can only refer to the executive departments. I would love it if then everything else had a logical, like, and there's an agency and then an administration and there's an office and a bureau. <laughs> That's not how it works. These words did originally have meaning. An agency had to have an agent who was in charge of organizing the work. Administrations were um, administering laws. Bureau was just a fancy old timey word for office. Um, it would be great if that happened, but over time there's too many exceptions to the rule. 
So now it appears these things, it was just when they got established and how they got named. So you can have an agency, an administration, a bureau, a service, an office, a board, a foundation. Corporation has a little separate meaning. All of those. Just know this. Department's at the top. Everything else is not at the top. <laughs> That's how the language works for the federal government. Okay, what do we see here? We see the blue in blue is the legislative batch. There's the House and the Senate. But what's also in here is all the other legislative agencies. So they inc these include the Congressional Budget Office. You've heard hear that talked about a lot, right? The Congressional Budget Office. They're, they're the ones submitting numbers around the budget at the same time that the White House's Budget Office is submitting there. So this is how Congress and the White House budget people talk to each other. The General Accounting Office, there's a Publishing Office, and then the Library of Congress technically falls under the legislative branch. The judicial branch includes, of course, SCOTUS and the appeals courts that we know about, but this is also where our U.S. tax court is. You might have forgot about them. Also, the court of trade. So remember, states don't have individual trade. Michigan doesn't have a trade agreement with Canada. The U.S. has a trade agreement with Canada, right? So when there's disputes of that, it has to be at federal courts. This is also the court of appeals for veterans claims. Um and for the armed forces. So the armed forces has their own judiciary system going on, but when they have a court of appeals, it goes to the federal level. So it's a part of the federal government. And then everything in red for line items inside the budget <laughs> fall under the executive branch. So you see right there in the middle, we've got our cabinet agencies, we got POTUS, you got the VP, you got the cabinet agencies that are involved with there, but you also have a whole executive office of the president. Now that is an office that's often overlooked. It includes things like the Office of Management and Budget. It includes things, well, there's some important things like the National Security Council, obviously, but the Office of Administration, the Office of Presidential Hiring is in this agency. This is, this is a grouping of collective federal activities. I'm looking right here, by the way. Oh, go over here, so can we can me? <laughs> right here, this one right here. We're looking in that box. Um, this is also an issue if you have, let's say, an administration who comes in who might have been, I don't know, surprised they won the presidency. <laughs> um, they may not understand how important this executive office of the president is to staff, particularly when we talk about political appointees. And so this is uh, one of those areas of the government that can get overlooked, but it's only at our peril. It's just going to make everything run um not as quick or not as efficient as, as it could be. All right, everything in that red box that's in the left-hand corner of the slide, those are independent or semi-independent government agencies. So if you've ever wondered, where does NASA go? It's its own agency, okay? And I'm gonna use the word agency with a little a. I'm gonna refer to it to all the crazy stuff that doesn't have a word, okay? Um, the CIA is here, the EPA, the Fed, which is a system, the Federal Reserve System. They, they decided for another collective now <laughs> um, that's there. Uh, a lot of great stuff is falling under independent agencies. These all still have heads. They all still report up a chain. A lot of times they're reporting to individuals in the White House, um, and that's why the Executive Office of the President has, has, has said there's, there's a, a chain of command that goes on with their reporting. They also... Sometimes these agencies are created by Congressional Act, and so there's specific reports they have to submit to Congress on a basis. That doesn't make them part of the legislature, though, so they're still funded under the executive branch. And then this purple box, this purplish box that's off on our right, those are government-owned or sponsored enterprises. So what's the one you think of? These are corporations. What's the one that usually jumps to mind when I say a corporation that the U.S. government is somehow involved in? Corporation for Public Broadcast usually comes out. PBS, NPR, okay, that are around these. Um, this is also where we end up having the, and what is it called here? I can't even read it on my slide. Uh, the, the <laughs> see if I can read it over here. Uh, the National Railroad Passenger Corps, which we know by its, its um, consumer name, Amtrak. Okay, Amtrak is here too. So why are some, what are these enterprises that are over here? These are different activities that over time were usually started, not always, but usually started as private enterprises. So think of the railroad, right? We don't have the gilded age without private railroads, right? 
railroads. But the government at some point decided, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> like, like we we need to have some vested interest in this. I need the railroads to go where we need to move people, right? And there needs to be some safety standards around. Um, and so we are going to uh we're going to invest in these companies, we're going to create them as corporations, and we'll have some oversight over them. However, you can still go make money. Go make money, Amtrak. That's perfectly fine. For public broadcasting NPR, it's the situation of us needing to have ha having made decisions during the um, during the 1930s and the 1940s that we needed our citizenry needed to have access to the airwaves, needed to have access to the new um, TVs that were coming in the 1950s. We wanted rural areas, we wanted areas all across the country, poor as well as rich, to have access to that. So we're going to invest in these and we're going to use different endowments in order to fund um, these situations. This does. Does NPR or does the Corporation for Public Broadcasting have line items in the, the federal budget? Yes. Would doing away with them drastically improve the federal budget? No, <laughs> because they are also making money on their own, right? These are these are not the same thing. Now, one thing to note is that the United States Postal Service, where did it fall out when it stopped being a department? It went under this independent and semi-independent government agency. There's an alphabetical order, so Postal Service is at the bottom of that second column, U.S. Postal Service, um, that there is. Now, the Postal Service, they're kind of, they call themselves the red-haired stepchild of, of the organization. They've been demoted down from cabinet level. They're now a semi-independent agency. There is a shift, the last postmaster general and the current postmaster general, there is a shift to move them even more private. So they're probably gonna end up going back into that purple bucket eventually, if it all shakes out. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second um, with them. So the Postal Service is an organization that's in constant flux, um, particularly around funding. Okay, so who works for that monster of an agency slide? 9.2 million people. Um, and they are in five different categories, the active duty military, the Fed civilian, the federal contractor, the federal grant employee, and the postal service worker. Now, what's in red there was I decided to put down some of the terms I see the media use when they're talking about these groups of people. So federal civilians are usually called feds. That's what they call themselves, or feds. You'll hear them called fed civilians or civilian employees when they're working in the DOD. So if they're working at the Department of Defense, but they're not active military, they're sometimes just called civilians um, because the military has to have its own slang. But feds is the most common thing. And you'll hear that uh, or see that rather in the print media a lot. The swamp. What do people mean when they say the swamp? Um, it's not just the geographical area of the D.C., Maryland, Virginia, which was Sant. Um, the DMV, that, that area. It also is referring usually to the federal civilian and contractor, because if you read enough, they're exempting military from everything they're talking about, right? Grant employees get completely ignored, so they're not talking about them. And then the Postal Service funds itself, so they don't talk about them. <laughs> they're really talking about the feds and the federal contractors. And then the word contractor legally is talking about contractors that have contracts with the federal government and talking about federal grant employees. Now, here's the difference between that. A grant is something you apply to. It's given to the grant recipient. It can come from most any executive agencies and some legislative agencies. Um, it's given to the grant recipient. The grant recipient then has stipulations of how they report out at the end of the grant. A contract is an, is an actual contract. So there, I could do a four-week class on government contracting. It, it's insane how much goes into the federal contracting. But federal contracting, when you have a contract with the government, there's there's it stipulates how you're going to be paid. You're usually paid by a unit basis if you're manufacturing something for the federal government, or you're paid by time basis if you're doing administrative work for the federal government. There are reports that have to be done monthly. There's reports that have to be done quarterly. There's reports that have to be done annually. Sometimes those have to roll up to larger reports that's coming that is necessitated from Congress. Every contract has what's called a contracting office uh, officer and a contracting officer representative, a CO and a core. Sometimes they have a COTAR, a contracting officer technical representative. So you can imagine every contract has that. So that's a lot of federal workers just working on managing contracts, right? Grant recipients, very different, usually done at the agency level 
But when we talk about contractors, often the media is talking about both of those in the same place. Now we'll take a second to talk about contractors because we're gonna break them off here in a second. I worked as both a Fed and a federal contractor, okay? There are agencies where these two groups do not meet. So when I worked with the Department of Defense, originally as a contractor, I worked in a building adjacent to where the federal workers were. So it was a business park, they were in one tower, we were, all the contractors were in another tower. When a meeting was called, I had to go over to the federal space for the meeting. The feds did not come to us, right? We went over and met with the feds. Um, but we all had the same access into systems. But when I was working offsite, I had my own computer that my company gave me. I had my own cell phone that the company gave me. I did have access credentials to get into the systems I needed to get into on the government side, but it, it wasn't the same situation. And it was pretty clear who was who. Um, even Our emails, even at the time, they'd done away with it, but the emails used to designate there was a three letter code in the email that would even designate that I was a contractor versus being um, a federal employee. Now, later, I went to work with the Defense Department inside a building with feds. We were at the TRICARE Management Activity Building in um, Falls Church, Virginia. We were all in the same area. You could not tell contractors and feds apart. Our emails were the same. We worked on the same computers. We had the same cell phones. Our access cards, which look like this, when you're in the DOD, you have a common access card. When you're with the um, outside of the DOD, any other agency, you have what's called a PIV, a personally identifiable vehicle, because again with the collective nouns, um, <laughs> with those, they're the same. The only difference would be way down here in the corner, it would say C for contractor or G for government. But that was it. It got you into the building, got you into the systems you were supposed to get into. Mine got me into the server room because I worked in IT. Feds couldn't get in the, or the feds couldn't get in the server room. Only the contractors who were supposed to be in there could get into the server room. You did not know. And the only way you knew, the only thing that contractors were not allowed to do, I should say, in the building was obligate federal funds on behalf of the US government. That was the only difference. So I couldn't sign a contract for a piece of IT software. I couldn't say, yes, we're going with Microsoft and here's $1.2 million. What I could do is all of the research on all the software, hold all the meetings to requirements of the software, go and get all the quotes from the vendors, tell them I needed the quotes with government pricing, put all that together. It was a while ago, so it was actually in a binder. <laughs> put that all together in a binder give it to my contracting officer who would say, oh yeah, which one should I pick? That one, great, thanks. Tell him I'm good, give me the contract. And then that person signed. So all the work was being done by contractors, but the obligations of funds was being done by government employees, okay, federal workers. So depending on where you've worked or where you've heard people work, or if you have friends or family that have worked in the federal government, they may have contractors embedded with them, they may not. What I really wanna emphasize is that contractors, are doing a bulk of government work. And next week when we talk about the budget, this is gonna come up. Is it cheaper? That's a big question. Big question for us to all be thinking about. Okay, what are the differences between the labor groups? Feds and military paid directly by the government, contractors have this third party, and then the postal service is paid by the United States Postal Service, which has its own budget. So it, ha it isn't federal dollars specifically. The reason Postal Service employees stay as federal employees is because they get federal benefits. Now you'll notice that there's an asterisk next to that. That's because starting next year, they're gonna pull federal benefits differently than other federal workers. It's part of their process of converting over to being a more uh, a corporation-like entity within the government. So they're gonna stop getting the federal health benefits. They're gonna start getting what's called Postal Service benefits was is not being administered by the same two agencies inside of the federal government. It is something that postal employees and annuitants are very concerned about. There's lots of listening sessions, lots of activities happening this year. So this is a very big deal for postal workers um, that's going on. Feds and military receive their benefits from the government, but contractors get that from their independent companies. Um, there are a lot of rules and regulations around what contractors can pay, a lot. And they're, they, they're all about protecting workers. Bottom line is they're getting minimum wage and higher, oftentimes um, much higher. And it's based, their salaries are really based on what the industries around them are paying. So their geographical area, 
um, as well as what the actual labor category is that they're paying, okay, um, that go with that. So you don't, you don't, it, it happens, but you don't often read about, in the United States, you don't often read about contractors doing exploitive pay for their workers because of all the regulations. Outside the United States, when we do have contractors that have, the contract companies that have contracts outside the United States, totally different story. It's not the same rules and regulations that apply. Big thing here is how we treat these labor groups during a government shutdown. So let's talk about Postal Service first. They're not affected by the government shutdown because they're paid by Postal Service, so they still get paid. Contractors are not reimbursed after a government shutdown. So when you hear, oh, don't worry, government shutdown, everybody will get their back pay, not the contractors. Now, we cannot force them to work. So they're just at home. You cannot force a contractor to work if you are not going to pay them. There are some contracts that are paid, usually these are unit-based projects where you know, you've paid prepaid for a chunk of time. And so it's usually two weeks or a month or, or sometimes it's by actual labor hours. So we've paid for last month, your invoice, uh, we obligated to you um, $100,000 for 100,000 hours of work. It wouldn't be that, but I'm just making numbers up. 100,000 hours of work, but you only build this um, 90,000 work. You technically have 10,000 hours of work that you can continue to bill us and we've moved the money to the right pocket of money. If there's a small government shutdown, the contractor could bill for that 10,000 hours of work, for instance. So they don't all immediately go home on the day a government shutdown starts. It depends on the type of contract they are. Also depends on where they are. If they're in their own facility and they have that obligated fund of $10,000, okay, they can report to their facility and work for 10,000 hours. If they work in a government facility and the government facility shut down, they can't go to work. So it doesn't matter that they obligated money or not obligated money to the contractors, they can't show up to work. They do not get reimbursed. Now, the feds and military will eventually get reimbursed during a government shutdown, but we can force them to work during a government shutdown. So one of the things agencies do right before a government shutdown is they determine who is essential and who is non-essential employees. Non-essential people are told, don't show up. Don't even, don't even do it. Don't do it. Don't come to work. Um, just, just go home. Essential workers are told, you have to show up to work. So I want you to imagine you're in a government shutdown. You're an essential worker. These are the prison guards. These are the law enforcement agents that are showing up, right? These are the people paying your social security checks. They're showing up to work. Could be showing up to work for weeks. And they know they're not going to get that next paycheck. What is that doing to their morale? What is that doing to their budgets? And in many areas, feds are married to feds. Military people are married to federal workers or federal contractors are married to federal workers, right? So we have families that have multiple federal incomes coming in. These are usually middle-class incomes. So we're talking about middle-class people and how the government uh, affects them. Now, eventually they will get back pay, but it's not like they get that accrued, right? And depending on where you live in the United States, and we'll see in a second, most federal workers don't live in the DC area. Depending on where you live in the fed, where you live in the US, your bank might not have some contingency plan for you, might not have a way to have a 0% interest loan to help you pay that mortgage or help you pay those bills that are coming due, right? So government shutdowns are a big deal, despite what some people in Congress might tell you. <laughs> they are a big deal and shouldn't be entered into like, all right, political appointments. Let's talk about those for a second. Um, there are four categories of political appointments. So just bottom line is there's four to 9,000 political appointments in the federal government. Why is that number so disparate? <laughs> because that 9,000 includes all the people we've ever had as a political appointment, which sometimes that position can be a political appointee or it could not be a political appointee. Or sometimes we don't have those positions always filled. So it can be upwards of 9,000, but 4,000 is about the number, four to 5,000 is about the number each administration has of political appointees. Um, there's four categories, presidential appointment requiring Senate confirmation, one not requiring Senate confirmation. Then you have what's called the non-career senior executive service. So the senior executive service is the C level of the government, the CIO, the CEO, right? They're the extreme execs of each department, of each agency is a senior executive service, an SES. They're paid different. They get different benefit system um, that goes into them. About 
of our SES is what's called non-career SES, meaning that they are political appointees, okay? And then we have confidential or policymaking positions. A lot of these are in the intelligence units. Um, and so we don't have great numbers, <laughs> how many are existing in all these. But these are called Schedule C employees. The important thing about political appointments is not all political appointments come from the president. That's just the ones we hear about and the ones whose Senate confirmations we hear. You can have political appointees from the agencies. This is where most non-career SESs are. The agency is saying, I need a policymaker because this administration wants me to tackle a policy we've never talked, we've never had before. I need to bring in a policy expert on policy X. So can you guys fill this non-career SES position with this political appointee? So it is recommended to the White House. And then the White House either signs off on that, or if it has to go to the Senate, the Senate has to sign off on that. Also, not all these Senate appointed ones, all 1,200 of them that need Senate approval, they don't each get their own little individual hearing for hours on end on C-SPAN, okay? What, what usually happens is these go through the specific committees they're supposed to go through in the Senate, and they look at them in bulk. Anybody have an objection to anybody in these 10 people? Great. Let's move to the next 10 people. Let's move to the next 10 people. And then a big bill goes to the Senate, or a big motion goes to the Senate floor and the Senate votes on bulk for these individuals, okay? They're going that. All of this is identified in what's called the Plum Book. I won't talk a lot about it today, but look up the history of the Plum Book. It's very interesting. Um, it has a plum cover. Um, and up until recently, it's been an actual book. There was something called the Plum Act that was recently passed. And that stands for Periodically Listing Updates to Management Act. Um, so God bless their little hearts. Congress wanted to make that word stick, <laughs> uh, Plum Act. Uh, so this will actually be available to all of us, to U.S. citizens. This is the book that categorizes all of the political appointees and tells you who they are, who they were, between administrations, who added political appointees and who got rid of them. That's the Plum Book. This up, up until recently, this was really an exercise between administrations. It was part of the transition from one administration to another was to hand over the plum book. Again, we got a little confused in the past 10 years, let's say, <laughs> with how this book was moving around the government. And so now Congress has taken over that thing. All right. So one of the things you hear a lot about is the federal government is too big. There's too many federal employees. So I don't have an answer on whether or not that's true. I'm not suggesting if it's true or not. I'm suggesting that everything we've talked about, that giant diverse scope of work, whether or not you agree with it or disagree, that might be a policy or political decision. Financially, it's a whole other ball of wax. And when we talk about the people who actually work for the federal government, the data isn't showing that we're a growing behemoth, right, <laughs> out there. So this is federal employment from 1939 to 2016. The red is civilian, so the feds, right? The blue is military, and that black is the Postal Service. And as you can see, it's undulated since World War II. It's undulated up and down, up and down, but we're on a downward trajectory right now. We have less political, um, or we have less federal workforce than we have in the past. Another way to look at this, this is actually by administration. So we're looking at the percentage of Americans working for the federal government for the same time period we just saw. And you can see, again, undulating up and down, but we're on the downward stroke, right, of federal workers and being the percentage of the overall U.S. population in general. We can look at it a different way. <laughs> this is only looking at the Fed. So this is looking at that 2.1 million civilian federal workers. And you can see the, the federal government share of total employment, again, from the 50s to now, we're on a downward trajectory. Less federal workers overall coming in. I believe I have one more chart. So as you can imagine, it's not like we've gotten rid of a lot of work, right? And we're a bigger country, 330 million people. So we'd have more Social Security benefits, more Medicare, more veterans. We'd have more things to do, right? So how are we covering all this work when we're reducing the federal workforce? Technology explains some of it, but so do contractors, okay? So in this chart, what you're seeing here, you look at the, what is, what are we going to call that? Peach, the peach line and the green line. 
the contractors and the grant. Federal workers are going down. Military's going down, trending down, trending down, right? Postal service trending down. But contractors and grant are rising. Okay, keep this in mind because we're gonna start talking about statistics. There's gonna be a lot of good bar graphs coming up. And <laughs> I know, just what you wanted. There's some pie graphs too, just thrown in for, for good measure. Um, and some line graphs maybe here and there. But keep this in mind because we have a real problem with the federal workforce coming up and that's retirement. Okay, so let's talk about each one of these individually. Um, this is the number of active duty US military personnel. It's, it's fallen 37% since 1980. You do hear a lot about in the media about how they're having trouble filling up the military, right? This is part of it, we do have this. Remember right now too, there's five branches of the military. Don't forget about Space Force, it's out there, okay? okay. But Coast Guard is now Homeland Security. So don't get confused by that either. Okay, so we see a falling. This is a great graph. This is the this is actually looking at um, the racial diversity of the military. That top line is the U.S. population. So you just want to look at the top line and see how everybody kind of matches to the U.S. population. What we're seeing is the Navy is the most racially diverse, um, but you're also seeing if you just want to look at that dark blue line of Black and African Americans. And again, this is how they have self-identified: um, Black and African Americans. Besides um, Space Force and the Marine Corps, we're seeing that those populations are actually very commiserate with the U.S. population or even exceed the numbers of the U.S. population. So the military continues to be a large employer for the African-American community in this country. But we see some of the other racial groups as well um, starting to populate that out. Now, for reasons I could not figure out, the military has decided to grump all Hispanic and Latino populations in with white. And then they ask a sub question. Nobody else does, the government, the rest of the government labor statistics don't do this, but the military does. So this is the Hispanic or Latino population in um, the armed forces. You'll see the population as a whole, it's 19%. Marine Corps exceeds that. Navy and Army though are pretty close. They're pretty close to having that 19%. So we're having a military that is reflecting us as a nation, racially at least. Not so much gender wise. <laughs> Uh, we don't even have the line up there for what the gender breakdown in the country is. It's 51% female, 49% male, fluctuates between 51 and 53% female in the country. Um, but look at Navy and Air Force. Almost one in every five Navy or Air Force personnel is female or identifies as female. Um, so that's that's progress on there. Age. So obviously the military is going to skew younger than the general workforce because it's the military and they have a lot of uh, physical demands on their jobs. But as you can see here, when we're looking at the 41 and older, we're usually looking at officers. We're looking at the top commanders. Um, they go along with that. Space Force has the most. Okay, this is because, and Space Force actually has the oldest force of anywhere in the military. Um, the reason for this is because it's a new agency. So they needed to bring over a lot of officers. They needed to bring over a lot of policymakers to kind of establish the agency, what its parameters would be, and, and what they actually work. And then I would suspect that it's going to start seeing a little bit more closer to what the Air Force is looking at as far as age is concerned. Okay. Let's talk about the federal civilians. All of the statistics you're about to see are from the Department of Labor, um, which does an annual survey of the Fed workers. And um, so we have some interesting information about them. So, okay, if you're going to study the pretty graphs, this is the one pretty graph you stick in your head. 70% <laughs> of all employees at the Fed level, so that 2.1 million of federal civilian workers, work for defense or security related agencies. 70%. Now, the number is slightly skewed because of the Veterans Administration. Most of the Veterans Administration has something to do with healthcare. So a lot of these individuals are healthcare workers, but they're categorized as being part of the defense and security related agency. Regardless, <laughs> we're looking at the veterans, army, Navy, Homeland, Air Force, justice, defense, right? 70%. So if you hear politicians talking about reducing the size of the government or reducing the budget by eliminating the Department of Education, that's not on this list. That's not where the most workers are. That's, and we'll find out that's not where most budget is. Now they could have a political reason or a policy reason for wanting to do that, great. 
But if their reason is to reduce the size of the federal government or the scope of the federal government, the numbers don't bear that out. They don't bear that out. The second graph on this page is age. Look at how old the federal workforce is. Look at that 50 to 54 range. So the dark blue number. So we're looking at the green. Oh, this one's a bar graph, right? Like, yeah, I've got bar graphs all over. <laughs> um, uh, for this. Down at the bottom, I know it's a little hard to see, but the legend will tell you that the over 50 population in the U.S. labor force is 33.5%, 33%, but in the government, it's 45% of over 50. So there's a couple of reasons for that. The federal government having lots of rules against age discrimination is part of that. Um, but it's also very concerning when we're talking about planning for an aging workforce and retirement and retirement benefits that go along with paying those individuals as they retire. The federal workforce is mainly a professional and administrative agency. At one point, it was mainly clerical. Uh, I like to think about uh, every World War II movie I've ever seen with the women typing in long rows <laughs> uh, from that. Uh, but there are technical jobs that uh, government employees do, um, white collar as well as blue collar, a lot of construction work, especially around military bases. Um, but professional administrative, that would have been the category I, I was in for my whole career as an IT project manager. Okay. All right, and white and black Americans, now these are labor department terms. I think it's kind of odd to use the word overrepresented, <laughs> but they're overrepresented in the federal government. Hispanic Americans are underrepresented in the federal government. Again, we're looking at the workforces, the pink bar, the total U.S. population is that blue bar um, that's there. So you can kind of see the disparities. Something to draw your eye to is the amount of American Indian and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders we have working in the federal government. It's almost twice as much as they represent in the population. So that's a huge, that means that we're kind of a big employer. Um, to Native Americans and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. This has to do with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. This has to do with the, um, the Indian Health Services. Um, this has to do with the Tribal Police. This has to do with the National Park Service. That's usually where we're um, finding those populations of the workers. Okay, and a couple of pie graphs, throwing those in there for you guys. <laughs> um, so I wanted, to, I, I should have rearranged these a little. Let's talk a little bit about sex first. So. Very similar um, to what we're seeing in the U.S. population, 57.3% male, 42.7% female. Now, the reason males are skewing more, I would say this would look almost exactly like the U.S. population, except for one thing. When you apply for a job as a federal civilian, there you, and you can go to usajobs.gov if you want to see all the jobs that are currently open in the federal government. When you go out there and apply for these jobs, you have to specify if you fall into any special categories. And one of them is veteran. If you're a veteran, you can click it. Another one is disabled. Okay, and there's some other, there's there's other ones about grant recipients, about um, being a Pacific Islander. There's some other ones you can check. Veterans go straight to the top. No one beats a veteran. So if you're a hiring manager and you get resumes in, and you're looking at the resumes that come in, you're told which ones are veterans and they get what's called veterans preference. It doesn't mean they automatically get the job. They have to go through the interview process. They have to pass the background check, et cetera. But you have to have a compelling reason not to grant a veteran an interview for a job. So veterans are overrepresented in the federal government because they get veterans hiring status. So in the actual uh, labor workforce of the United States, Veterans, the civilian workforce, comprise 5.9% of total employed. As you can see, they represent 32.9% of federal workers. So we have a lot of veterans. The military skews male. You have a lot of veterans in your force, you're gonna have a lot more male in the federal workforce because of that. So these, these things are connected to each other. This last one, percentage of total workers by location. So 85.3% of federal workers are not in the DSC area. They aren't there. Now they're spread out all over the country. So why do we not see them? <laughs> we hide them in the prisons <laughs> um, and on the military bases. But a lot of them have to do with parks or agriculture. Um, and they're in the big cities. Remember, the district courthouses of all these U.S. districts, all these U.S. attorneys are going to sit in cities, right? Going to be in the big cities. So here, 
In um, Michigan, we have clusters of federal employees in Detroit. We have them in Grand Rapids. We have some in Lansing. We also have some up in Sault Ste. Marie. Remember, we have a border with Canada up there. So we have a, a pocket of federal employees up there as well. Here's a great percentage of federal government employees by each state. If you haven't run into a lot of federal employees, it might be because you're living in the Midwest. So the um, the darker the blue, the more federal employees exist in that those areas, the lighter the blue, um, the less. And you'll see the Midwest is a little bit of a pocket of less federal workers compared to the rest of the United States. Um, that's out there. Okay, I would love to go as in depth on federal contractors as I just did on feds, but Turns out we don't have that data. Why don't we have that data? Because the federal, the Department of Labor doesn't do a survey of contractors. They do a survey of contracting companies. We can talk about the contracting companies that are out there. How many of them are women owned? How many of them are small businesses? How many of them are minority owned or veteran owned? But their actual statistics on their individual employees, they keep really close to the vest. And there was, um, there's actually an agency that's in charge of monitoring this, the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Program, the OFCCP. I have a pet peeve. If you have more than four letters, I should be able to pronounce it. FEMA, NASA. I don't like OFCCP. I don't like that at all. Um, so they've been pushing, and this is a big initiative under the Biden administration, but pushing contractors to get more data on the demographics of these companies. Unfortunately, a lot of the big wigs, the big companies, federal contractors are pushing back. So these are companies with billions in taxpayer dollars that do not want to disclose data around their hiring practices, okay? Lockheed Martin in four years got $254.9 billion from the federal government is fighting us on handing over that information about their labor workforce. So I did find this graph. <laughs> Doesn't help us at all about who's working for them, but it, it's a tattletale list. The government published that for us. <laughs> um, what we do know is something about management of companies that are federal contractors. And the reason we know this is because their boards are often public. And they also often have to um, publicly uh, put out information about management statistics for trade industry. And so there are some policy centers that have gone ahead and collected this information. It's based, you know, it, it's not one for one ratio, but it's the closest we can get. You can see here that most um, most profitable contractors are sluggish on diversifying management. I think that's just a nice way of saying we don't really know how diversified um, these contractors are. And for women, we're really looking at that this is management, of course. We're not looking at the whole part of the organization. But for management, it appears that men are outstripping women um, on this one as well. Now, what we can say is where the highest percentage of government contractors are per capita um, and it will be no surprise that this is very similar to what we saw with the government workers themselves, right? That these these places are matching up. Um, so if you have a lot of government workers in one place, a lot of feds in one place, you're going to have a lot of federal contractors in one place because they're supporting what the feds are doing. Um, so Maryland and D.C. and Virginia are there, but also Alaska, Wyoming, Montana. And we saw those as being more blue on the last map as well. Okay, I'm really quickly gonna talk about, I got just a couple more. I promise it's not a graph, it's a map, it's a map. <laughs> um, couple maps about postal service and then I'm gonna show you something and get you out for that eclipse. <laughs> okay, when we talk about those half a million poor postal service workers that are in the middle of transitioning. Okay, the postal service is in charge of their own data. They liked maps for some reason, God bless them. <laughs> this is a hard map to read. Bottom line is this. The more bluer it is, the more white their workforce. The more it's in that orange category, it means that minorities are better represented in the postal workforce, okay? So less represented, more represented in the postal workforce. So you can see there's actually a really good mix here. There's a lot going on in the postal workforce between minorities and minority populations. Here's interesting. In 18 states in the DC, women are more than 50% of the US Postal Service workers. And that includes the state of Michigan. So I am not surprised that the only two House members I now know about who <laughs> worked for the Postal Service are both women, okay? So you're more likely to run into a female Postal Service worker in the state of Michigan than a male Postal worker. That's interesting. Don't know why historically that's happened, but it has, okay? And again, we're seeing veterans. Veterans have 
um, preference in hiring. Um, federal worker positions are on USAjobs.gov, uh, and so we're seeing higher percentages of veterans populations. Even in the states that are the lightest blue, it says less than 15%. Remember, they're only 6.9% of the U.S. total population. So if you have 15%, you're, you're doubling the amount of people in your workforce that are veterans or have veteran status than in the total labor force. So it's still a really good um, job industry for, for veterans. Okay, so all of that is about our federal system, how it's organized and who works for it. But we are consumers of federal services. And so I'm going to humbly present to you today my top 10 websites, okay? The top five websites, I think, if you want to be a more informed and productive citizen, and the top five websites for if you just want to have some fun with the federal government's resources, okay? You don't have to copy these down. I promise to send everybody who's registered for a course a list of these after the class, okay? So you don't have to do that. What I do want to make sure is that the people online can see what I'm doing so can you see the screen right now, Marion? Perfect. Okay. All right. The first one, I'm going to have to put on my glasses, congress.gov. What is the House up to today? What is the Senate up to today? What the heck is this bill I keep reading about in the newspaper? You go to congress.gov. How do I write to my representative? You don't write. You, you email your representative. <laughs> How do I email my representative? You go to congress.gov. So we can see right here, uh, the House is not in session. The Senate is not in session. Okay. Oh, fun times. <laughs> if you if they were in session, you could click <clears throat> on the activities, and you would actually be able to see that that C-SPAN camera that comes around, right? That shows you the House floor, um, and it would actually show you what they were doing. So in this situation, this is the last time they were in session, which was last week. They they gaveled themselves in. They convened at 9 a.m. and they gaveled themselves out at 9.03. Okay, all right. <laughs> they said they'd meet at 12 p.m. tomorrow and they are, uh, no, that's the resolution they adjourned on, whatever. <laughs> that's what they did yesterday. If you follow this, if you're a wonk and really get into that and get into this, you'll find out just how much time Congress spends naming post offices. They spend a lot of time naming post offices. So this is a great resource. If you ever wanted to search bills by the actual, like if you wanted to know, what is Gary Peters up to? What is Senator Gary Peters from the state of Michigan, who runs, by the way, the Senate confirmation or the Senate um, Committee on Homeland Security and the federal workforce. So as Michiganders, we have a straight link into the senator who runs the committee that actually makes all the policies about federal workers. Um, you can actually click on House or Senate. You can find them by their individual names and you can communicate with them that way. So congress.gov. The second one, the supremecourt.gov. Okay. If you read about an opinion that you're interested in, okay, the judgments are called opinions in the, the courts. And you, you, why worry about how the Washington Post or the Holland Sentinel or anybody else has summarized what actually happened? Go out and actually read the opinion. You don't need a law degree to do this. The opinions of the court, um, you just click on the opinions of the court, they're sorted by year. You can also see, hear the um, actual oral arguments. Those are all posted the day after. So if you want to hear them live, you got to go to like whoever's having them live, C-SPAN usually. But if you want to do the day after, all the oral, oral arguments of the Supreme Court are posted on the supremecourt.gov. You can see the opinions of the court. So let's say we want to go back a couple of years. We want to go to 2021 and we actually want to read the Dobbs decision. What did they actually say in the Dobbs decision? You can actually click on it. It'll give you the entire opinion. It gives it to you as a PDF, so you should be able to read it from any device that you have. And it gives you, first it gives you the opinion of the majority, and then it gives you all of the dissents and all of the footnotes. So everything is right there in front of you, so you can argue with all of your friends and be the life of the party. All right, let's say, uh, how many people live in the state of Michigan? How many of them are women? You're gonna wanna explore the census. Okay, the census data that's out there. Try searching poverty in Georgia. Okay, how about I try searching poverty? Whoops, I'm gonna spell it right. <laughs> poverty in Michigan. And I click on that. Probably won't work because I'm up here. So <laughs> um, it'll give me, so it's looking at the state of Michigan and click on it. It's giving me information about the state of Michigan. 
populations, median incomes, and I can click on the different reports and drill down. So anytime you need a good stat that has to do with anything with our population um, or anything to do with what you what you know comes from the census, you can just go out there and get it, data.census.gov. Another great one, USA.gov. I know it sounds like it's a scam. It's not a scam website. <laughs> it's USA.gov. So this is supposed to be, it was originally started to supposed to be a one-stop shop for citizens to just go out and be able to find all federal services. But then it turned out all of the departments wanted their own website <laughs> when they wanted to do fun stuff themselves. So it didn't turn into that. So, but you can, if you ever have a question like, well, how do I renew my passport or where do I register to vote? Anything that it does on those high levels, you can come to usa.gov. And the one I really want to draw your attention to, I'm scrolling down the page here. You keep continue forward. You'll get to scams and fraud. This is where you go and report all scams and fraud. Okay. So if you're ever scammed and remember, uh, when the FBI agent was here for the monthly program, talked a little bit about elder fraud, elder scams. We have the brochures still out in the um, outside by the library if you like to pick one up. This is where you would go to report anything like that so the government can continue to track scamming. And lastly, for productivity, I think this one's super important, but I have a master's in criminal justice, so. <laughs> um, the Federal Bureau of Investigation Crime Data Explorer. This is where you can drill down. Is the homicide rate really increasing in the US? Is the violent crime rate really increasing? The answer is yes. But <laughs> you can go here and drill down. How about me in Ottawa County? How about me in Michigan? How about me in the Midwest? You can do it by individual region. region. So you can go to the, the data discovery tools or you can just click on the individual maps. So if I click on the state of Michigan um, for the year, uh, 2022, let's say I just want to look at violent crime. I can see that this is our violent crime rate from 2012 to 2022. And you can see the federal crime rate as well. So we're having a precipitous drop, whereas the rest of the nation is leveling out on violent crime. But you can do specific crimes as well in there. Um, I'll just plug a little bit that when we come, not all law enforcement agencies um, contribute to the system that, that where this data is coming from, but the vast majority majority do, the vast majority do here in Michigan. Um, sometimes the red states don't contribute their data as, as expeditiously as the blue states do. There's some political issues going on with the data itself. But when we talk about actual crime statistics, it's homicide and vehicle theft where we have the best numbers because there's bodies and there's cars that need reports to get your insurance money. <laughs> okay. All other crimes, we don't always have great statistics on how those are being reported. Okay, those are five websites to make productive. Five websites, really quick, if you just want to play around. The CIA has this wonderful thing called the World Factbook. This is not CIA.gov, it's the World Factbook. They give you a fact a day. Um, so today's one is about zoo lovers in Austria. Okay, whatever. <laughs> but if you click on the 30-day archive, it just gives you a fun fact each day from some over, somewhere all over the world. And it's often written by um, different workers at different embassies and consulates over the world. You guys are probably familiar with the MPS.gov, the National Park Service. Um, besides the fact that you can explore different topics like viewing the solar eclipse, how do you do it? Um, and different stories from the Park Service. Remember, you can always come and get individual parks. So it's a great place to start your planning. The National Park Service's app is phenomenal. It's really great for your phones. Not all government agencies have really great apps, but this one has a really great app that goes with it. Um, the Library of Congress, if you've never done the virtual, uh, oh, sorry, Library of Congress, <laughs> Library of Congress, Library, not the, not the museum, <laughs> we'll get to that one. Library of Congress is great. You can search the digital collections of the Library of Congress. They are out there. They are all digitized for you. So it's a great research tool as well as a great just black rabbit hole you can just fall into a day of clicking around <laughs> finding all cool stuff you want to know what thomas jefferson actually wrote if you want to know what hamilton's papers actually said if if you want to know um there's less luminary people <laughs> out there and then they always have this great top searches that are always switching it always appears to be regional um so or sorry, sorry seasonal 
So, you know, we're going to talk about Pearl Harbor, usually around December. It's kind of up there right now. There must have been something in the news that happened, but it kind of changes with the news. So if there's something big that happens in the news and you come to the library of congress.gov, they probably have it in their top search. The Smithsonian Institute. This is what I was saying. If you haven't gone on the Smithsonian Institute and seeing their um, virtual exhibits, please do too. Remember the Smithsonian is a selection of museums in the DC area, all of which are free um, for you, people to go to. Um, their collections are all on the website. So you can go and feel like you are in the museums. Or if you've never been to the African American History Museum, you can visit the entire collection online. Um, so you don't need to travel to DC to see that. They're opening new museums all the time. Um, if you've never been to the Museum of the American Indian, I really suggest you come on here and take a look at their actual archives um, that go along with that. And then they also have some great um, stories down at the bottom. And lastly, this is to me the Ung Sun Museum of the Smithsonian System, the National Post Museum. It exists off the, off the mall in DC. It exists near um, uh, Union uh, Station. And so people don't often go to it, but it's another free museum. And believe it or not, because they've taken this idea that anything that has to do with going through the mail applies to us, the post office. <laughs> they have a really large collection. It's not just stamps, though a lot of it is stamps. <laughs> but they have a lot, everything that put a stamp on it is part of the collection. Um, so they just have some really great exhibits um, that are going around. They also do have exhibits that map to the different stamps that are coming out. So if they have a historic series of stamps that come out, they'll have exhibits that match to that too. So another uh, great website for you to explore or to pass on with that. And with that, yes, it's before 2.15. <laughs> and with that, I will take any question anybody might have. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Do you have any in the chat room right now? No questions right now in the chat. On the floor, Al. <clears throat> With all the information that we can get hold of that comes out of our government, do we have any idea whether any other government on the planet does information like we do? I, I'm so glad you brought that up. It was actually something I was planning to say. As far as I'm, as far as I can tell, we're the gold standard as far as information is concerned. And th there's a lot of reasons probably for it. Um, there is some data that's not out there. It's usually around intelligence agencies. Um, we know that, for instance, when we talk about the number of federal workers, we're not actually very accurate when we talk about certain law enforcement agencies or certain intelligence agencies, because we keep those secret. But other than that, that's about it, um, that we keep secret. We are much more transparent government than people give us credit for. And each one of those executive departments, if you go to their websites, you will be fascinated by what's out there. I went to the transportation one and I was like, this this has to be boring as heck. And no, it wasn't. It's was really, they really try. Um, there was a big act in the 90s, I forget the name of it, that was about modernizing the federal workforce and including all these websites as part of what's offered from the federal government. So they're actually legally mandated to provide this information um, to us. They they have a lot of ways they can do that. Um, and, a lot of wiggle room, but most of them have really embraced it and have staffs that have really embraced it. Any other questions? Amy, I was wondering mm -hmm. um, when you were giving us some stats about um, workers and ages of workers versus uh, government employees versus labor force, those uh, individuals under 30 years of age, mm -hmm. there were only 6% of our population that would be government workers. And then in the in the US labor force, or 24%. Is the distinction there um, education levels or what, what are you thinking? Well, oh, that's a good one. So part of the problem is that statistic was showing federal workers versus military, right? So we, we know that the military is gonna appeal to younger Americans who are then gonna turn themselves into veterans who will then turn themselves into federal workers. So there's a slight education gap. But quite honestly, as somebody who's parenting teens right now, um, and as somebody who who worked with federal um, employees as they came in and who had to train them and onboard them and hire them, part of the other issue is it's just not appealing. People don't think of federal work the way it, it's been downplayed, it's been downcast, it's 
doesn't get talked about very nicely in certain circles, in certain communities, in certain states. People don't understand. When we talk next week, we're going to talk about what federal workers get paid as part of the overall budget. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you right now, it's not a huge portion of the budget. <laughs> that's not what that's not what's driving the federal budget up. But these are solid middle class jobs with good retirement packages, with good pension packages, with good healthcare benefits that you can raise a family on. It's not advertised out there, and especially on college campuses. Um, the education, you do get paid more and are, well, a lot of time you need a bachelor's to qualify for many of the Fed um, positions that are out there if you don't have veteran status. You do get paid more over the life of your federal service if you have a master's or a PhD. PhDs, though, get paid more in the private sector than in the government sector. Mm -hmm. We have one question in the chat. Mm -hmm. um, Amy, how did you happen to seek work in the federal government? Oh, that's a good question. So um, I was finishing up my PhD in criminal justice from the University of Chicago. I'm ABD, all but dissertation. <laughs> um, University of Chicago and my... A uh, fiance at the time, who became my husband, got a job as a U.S. Capitol Police officer. Um, and so we were living in Chicago. We decided to move so he could pursue his. He wanted to be FBI, went with United States Capitol Police officer. So we moved to D.C. And I, my dissertation was actually on small paramilitary policing units in rural areas, SWAT teams in rural areas. I defended my thesis topic um, a month before 9-11. So 9-11 happened and it completely changed the militarization of policing. Um, so at the time we didn't know that's what was happening. So I lost track of my PhD and I was in the DC area and thought, heck, I need to work. And so I went to work at a government contractor. They trained me to do um, IT project management. And then eventually I went over to FedWork when a position became available um, at an agency I was working for. So I, I kind of floated in the wind over to federal service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, this is a per, more of a personal question, but um, this, yeah, how would you know if you were a federal employee versus the uh, federal contract? So if you, if you get your paycheck straight from the federal government, you're a federal employee. If it comes from your company, you're a federal contractor. If your retirement and benefits are coming straight from, so you're part of the, um, the Federal Employee Healthcare Benefit Program or part of the uh, first system, the Federal Employee Retirement System, then you're part of being a federal employee. Otherwise, you probably have a 401k at your company. You're getting your health insurance from whatever they have um, that the company has. And some of these companies, you know, they're big. Northrop Grumman, you know, is a giant organization and I'm sure they have great benefits. I've never looked into it. Um, so I'm not saying one benefit is good to the other, but if it comes directly from the government, a federal employee, you also have had to have done background checks. You'll have to have done um, security clearances, sometimes depending on the work um, you'll have. Yeah, there's lots of ways. You'll know you got hired by the federal government unless there's some agency with three letters, Denny. <laughs> Pretends so I, you don't work for it. Mm -hmm. I was in American Samoa. Oh, okay. Work, worked at uh at the hospital. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Well, you you were working at the hospital, but were you and you weren't military at the time. No. And you weren't under the. Did you feel like you were working for I the was American? Working for the American Samoa government. Oh, okay, okay. So that's a very good distinction. So American Samoa, one of our territories right? Different. There, we've been talking about federal employment. There is local government work. There's state government work. There's territorial government work. So you may have been a government worker at the local or territorial level and not a federal government worker. Yeah, that's very true. And when we add up all of those localities and those municipalities, 11% of the American workforce works for the government. It's not all federal government. Um, I've got a question related to the uh, Heritage Foundation's Project 2025, where mm -hmm. they are mm -hmm. allegedly looking to replace huge numbers of 
federal employees and maybe others with people who subscribe to their ideology. And I'm just wondering what your take is on how feasible it is that they could get what kind of numbers replaced through that kind of a program versus people who are pretty much totally protected. Yeah. So when we had this, um, this was also came up during the Republican um, debates for the Republican um, primary debates as well. Um, so there's a big talking point that federal workers are protected. You can't fire a federal worker, right? You know, so obviously, and they're, and they're all against us somehow um, with this. My experience as both a Fed and a contractor, I never saw any corruption. I never saw any outright issues around lying or hiding money or anything like that. Did I see a lot of processes that were being bended to benefit contracting companies? Yes, I saw that. But I wouldn't call it graft. I, everybody I ever worked with was very diligent about working with taxpayer dollars and about being good stewards of taxpayers' dollars. That's something you're just drilled into your head um, when you work with the federal government. Um, there aren't protected individuals, but there are, are protected labor categories. So there are specific categories of workers. So when you talk about kind of the workers that are in the federal schedule, which is the bulk of the Fed civilian workers, um, they are protected under different laws than that SES category, that senior executive service category. It is easier to get rid of a senior executive service person than it is to get rid of the ones in the GS calendar, the general schedule is what they're called for the workers. It's also easier to get rid of the political appointees. So I suppose if you wanted to have an act of just bloodletting one day, you could just come in and fire all the political appointees. But then you wouldn't have a bunch of policymakers that are helping you um, with different policies that are being enacted. And maybe you want to replace those individuals, but you could only do it to a limited amount. And the next set of individuals that you'd have to bring in, 1,200 of them are going to need Senate confirmation hearings. So if you don't have the Senate, what are you doing with those positions? And those individuals who worked into a non-career position but had a career position prior to that can theoretically go back to those career positions too. Now, there's some debate I've heard from the Heritage Foundation about other labor categories that could be potentially in bulk eliminated. Um, I think that would be up to the courts. Um, one thing we didn't talk about here was unions. Um, most Fed workers are unionized. Most Fed contractors are not um, unionized. So there are different unions at play. There would be different legal issues at play um, that come into that. I, as a slight cynic, um, just my personal opinion, I think they're hiding the fact that they're trying to move the money to contractors. Because the work would still be there. You have to figure out if you don't want the work. If you don't want the work, then fine. But if you're just saying I'm an eliminated department and I still want the work to happen, well, where is it going to go? And who's going to do it? Yeah. But if you just say, I just don't want the work, I'm just not going to have an income tax anymore, get rid of the IRS. Well, okay. That's your bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Is there any synergy across all these organizations like a common payroll system or a common payable system or common receiving all the cash or does everybody have their own little processes and systems? No, that's actually, that's important. So the Postal Service has its own little system. The military has its own system, but it's fought for all five branches. And then the federal workers have um, a system that they fall under as well um, for pay. There are some exceptions to that for work that happens overseas, but for the most part inside of the United States, it's one system working for that. Contractors, it's all dependent on the agency they've contracted with, how they are individually paid. So that creates a mountain of paperwork from that. Grants are also specific to agencies because it's the individual agency that's grant that's awarding the grant and has put that in their budget. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's line items in budgets. Yeah. Anything else from chat? Are you okay? Nothing on the chat. Oh, here's bye. one. Thanks, Steve. Um, Amy, with the contractors, mm -hmm. when their contract runs out, is 
do they have the influence in some way to automatically keep it perpetually ongoing? And how do new agencies receive contracts at the level of the ones you showed on the screen? Right. So new contracts can always be let. I should. Yeah, which can always be let by agencies, and that'll start that'll start the process off. There are there. It's not quotas necessarily, but it's goals that each agency has to fill their contracts with small businesses. And these small businesses fall into categories around women-owned, disabled-owned, veteran-owned. You can be multiple categories with this. So there's each agency is specifically trying to fill certain contracts with small businesses. I'm just going to talk about IT contracts for a second. There are different types of contracts up, but the ones that I worked, which are what most professional administrative contracts looks like, they're four-year contracts. At the end of the four-year, you enter into a recompete. The incumbent, the person who's been doing the work, obviously has all the information about all the systems and all the technologies and your future plans and you, right? <laughs> so they're able to write a better proposal, but they're now four years into a contract, which means they gave their people raises for four years. So they are not going to be the cheapest. Sometimes they'll be able to twist it around and make it work with the money and they'll work with the government and they'll figure it out and they'll win. But oftentimes they bring in subcontractors. The subcontractors are small businesses. Sometimes they'll write the proposal for the small business. The small business will win an award and that incumbent is still a subcontractor to that small business. And the work continues over and over again. So yeah, Northrop didn't win all that money. Northrop's subcontractors won all that money. And Northrop, they also do some very specialized work. Um, there is a category of contract work that's super specialized. Like, you know, we don't want to recompete everybody on, you know, building a part of a space shuttle. <laughs> so we can't just open that up. Um, so there is some very highly specialized and some um, uh, secret clearance work um, that has to be, uh, there are certain agencies. And the way they do that is they release a package that individual companies bid on being able to do that work, not individual contracts. And then those agencies that are able to show the clearance levels are able to show the technical expertise, medical work falls into this, medical work will be able to show that they follow the protocols. Those are the only companies that are allowed to bid on those contracts moving forward. So that's called a vehicle. They're on a specific vehicle um, and only contracts on those specific vehicles can actually bid. Mm -hmm. oh, we have a question in the chat. Mm -hmm. What brought you to Michigan? I would think you were a loss to the feds. <laughs> oh. um, so I, well, my position was originally remote before COVID. So I moved here keeping my position with justice. They decided not to make it um, a, a remote position. I got a position of commerce that would but then commerce eliminated my group. And so that's how I fell out of federal service. My husband again, now I keep following him around like something. Um, he got, he switched from Capitol Police to Homeland Security. Um, so he works out of Grand Rapids with Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. So we, and he's originally from Michigan, I should say. He's originally from Michigan. So we were also moving back to family. Mm -hmm. All right. There is an eclipse happening. <laughs> yes. So if you want to stay here, you are more than invited to stay here with the HASP offices. You can meet Hannah. You can talk to her. Um, and if not, please get somewhere safe. Do not try to view it from the road while driving. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you, Amy. We'll see you again next week. Yeah, Same time. <laughs>